Let's pray in preparation for our sermon time. Father, you are indeed holy. Lord, we pray that today through your word you will expand our understanding of what that means, of what it means to have a God and a Father that is holy and perfect. And Lord, what that means for our lives, for our calling, Lord, to be your holy people. Part of that holiness, God, is walking and living in the wisdom that is ours through Jesus Christ. We ask you would grant us that gift today and, Lord, then the faithfulness to use it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to ask a question for you to think about. Who do you turn to uh, when you need wisdom? Do you have people uh, that are your go-to when you've got to make a decision, you're not sure what to do, when you're faced with some circumstance in your life where you don't understand uh, your options or which way to go? Um, I have been blessed with a lot of great wisdom and counsel in the people in my life. Uh, My dad uh, was a, had an incredible mind for business. Um, he had a moral code above reproach, and so I, I would go to him whenever I had any decision to make, like buying a car, buying a house, selling a house, selling a car, retirement planning, any of that kind of stuff, my dad was the one I would turn to. Uh, Lori, she was the best wife and mom that I could have ever asked for. Um, she had a gift working with kids. Uh, she, she demonstrated that in her speech therapy, but also in our home. Uh, she was great with James and Ellie, and I could not have had someone wiser with raising kids than Lori to do that with. Uh, then I've got my mom, and she's the godliest, kindest woman that I know. My mother-in-law is right there with her. Um, and so invaluable to me as a source of wisdom. And I could go on and on. Gosh, I could talk about our church. Um, There are people in this church, if I've got a legal question, I know who to talk to. If I've got a financial question, well, my dad's not here anymore, but there are guys in the church that fill that role, and I know who I could ask. Um, If I need grief counsel, I've got a lot of people here who've been through it and can give me wise counsel. Uh, Run into issues with my house, I've mentioned before, I know who to call. Uh, There are also, what a blessing for me in our church, we have men who are retired pastors with years and decades of service. And I hate to say names because I'm sure, I'm sure I'll miss somebody, but I was thinking about it. Dan Whitaker, Jimmy Hatcher, Terry Alverson, Howard Ledford, got music ministry people, David Burns, Alan Goodwin, on and on and on I could go. Men that I can turn to when I've got wisdom and I have, and I thank you for it. Well, you know what? Despite the wealth of wise counsel that God has has surrounded me with during my life, would you believe that I have been a fool more times than I could admit, despite all of that wise counsel? Um, It's not enough just to have those people around. We have to use that wisdom. We have to want it. We have to be humble enough to realize we need it. And we have to follow it, even when it might not be what we want to do. Um, That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at another foolish man, not just me, uh, but we're going to look at a man in the Bible named Rehoboam. Um, I'll give you, if you'd like to, your extra credit homework can be to read about Rehoboam beyond the passage we read. Like all of us, Rehoboam sometimes was wise and sometimes foolish, but as can often be the case, his foolish decisions had a pretty high cost. We're going to look at uh, probably the, the main story from his life today. Oftentimes in Bibles, you'll see the section, it, it, the heading will say, The Folly of Rehoboam. So that's what we're going to talk about. This is one of those lessons where we, uh, the last couple of weeks, Abigail and Solomon, we've looked at how we can imitate them in being wise. Now we're going to look at one of those, is how can we avoid being like that person who was foolish? in our pursuit of wisdom. And I want to thank God today that his word is so practical. These stories that we can read, 
They are just as helpful as a story can be. They're so real. They are so similar. Even though the circumstances and the time and the culture might be different, the world isn't that complicated. The things we deal with are the same people people have been dealing with for thousands of years. And so today, let us learn from Rehoboam. I'm going to give a little context before I read the passage, because you may or may not know much about Rehoboam. Um, someone told me they thought he was a woman. They said, oh, I thought Rehoboam was a woman. Said, well, it sounds kind of like it could be, but it's not. He, he was a man. Uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. We talked about Solomon uh, last week. That means he was the grandson of King David. And he had the unfortunate lot in life of inheriting a mess from his father Solomon. Um, Solomon had asked for wisdom and God gave it to him, but Solomon didn't follow it all of his days. And God rebuked Solomon at the end of his life for intermarrying with women from the various pagan cultures around uh, Israelites in the promised land. And God said uh, they had turned his heart to follow after their gods. So he had fallen into idolatry. And as punishment, God told Solomon, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Servant instead of a son. A son would be the rightful heir, generally. But God said, well, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and your family, Solomon, and give it to your servant. He said, but because of my promises to you, I won't do it in your lifetime. And I will give a little bit of the kingdom to your son. And so we'll see that Rehoboam basically got two tribes out of the 12. But the other 10, they followed a different king. So enter Rehoboam into this time after Solomon had been told the kingdom was going to be taken from his family. Uh, when it was time to be uh, coronated as king, we might say, uh, Rehoboam w- w- gathered the people of Israel, and one of Solomon's servants, a man named Jeroboam, who had been a ruler over sort of the labor forces in part of the kingdom, he set his sights on the throne, very much as God had said would happen. And so Jeroboam gathered support from a bunch of tribes, and he went to confront Rehoboam before he was coronated as king. And he came with a condition, and he basically said, me and all of these Israelites with me, we will only follow you in one condition. This is what he said. He said, Rehoboam, your father Solomon made our yoke heavy. You lightened the hard service that your father demanded, and if you will do this, then we will serve you. So Rehoboam said, go and come back in three days and I'll give you my decision. So Rehoboam had a decision to make. What was he going to do? And that's where we're going to pick up his story in 1 Kings chapter 12, reading verses 6 through 20. I will remind us this is God's word. So listen. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was still alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him, and he took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and who stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him, they said to him, thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So... Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king said, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men 
saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. All that means that God had prophesied that the kingdom was going to fall apart like this. Verse 16, And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was the taskmaster over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him Jeroboam king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, that would be Rehoboam, but the tribe of Judah only. So I hope that it was kind of clear what happened after Rehoboam ignored the counsel uh, that he first received. Basically, most of the kingdom said, if that's the way you're going to be, we're not going to follow you. We'll make Jeroboam our king. And this is when the kingdom of Israel split. And it was a split that lasted a long time and led both the north and the south, the, the two divided kingdoms, ultimately to ruin. So let's talk about wisdom a little bit. Um, in, in parts of this story, Rehoboam acted wisely, didn't he? Um, the first thing we would look at, and I know that some of these points as we go through stories about wisdom, they're going to be repetitive, but I think it bears repeating sometimes. Um, the first thing is that Rehoboam displayed wisdom in, in two ways early on. Uh, he took counsel with the old men, the elders who had served under Solomon. He asked them very directly, how do you advise me to respond to the demands of these people? There are two things I want us here to notice. First off, Rehoboam was humble enough to ask for help. He was humble enough to seek wisdom from someone else. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's tempting just to figure, well, I'll just make my own decision. I'm smart enough to know what to do. Um, We need the humility. We need to ask God for it. To recognize in our lives when we need help when we need wisdom. There is no shame in being needy when it comes to wisdom, all right? Sometimes we don't like, we call, we use needy as sort of pejorative term, a a criticism. Man, that person's so needy. You know what? We are needy. We need one another. That's not, there's no shame in that. That's how God made us. Um, Quite the opposite, what we will find is that shame is usually what befalls people who don't lean upon and seek the wisdom of other people. I'll give you a story for me, um, and I've shared this before, but I hope you've forgotten it, because I don't want to bore you with the same stories. Uh, When I went to seminary, I was 34 years old. Um, I had gone to college and gotten out when I was 22, you know, 1991. Well, this was 2003, 12 years later. I had been out of school a long time. I don't know if any of you have ever gone back to school when you're older, but it's intimidating. Because, you know, I thought, man, I don't have the energy that I used to have when I was a 20-year-old anymore. Um, I'm going to be not only back in school, but in graduate level stuff, this is going to be harder than it was. And let me tell you, my seminary degree was 10 times harder than my bachelor's degree. Um, It required so much more time. I was very intimidated by that. So in my wisdom, what I decided was, well, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to go try to find a church job while I'm in seminary because, man, you know, part-time in a church is full-time. They'll they'll just wear you out, right? I've been, I've heard that before. So I'm just going to go get a a part-time, basically minimum wage job to supplement the income. My my sweet wife's going to put me through school, my sugar mama. Um, She worked. So I got a job, roasting coffee. I'll tell you all about that. Anybody that wants to know. 
So um, did that, and then um, when I fin- finished seminary, excuse me, I began to realize what a mistake I'd made. Um, I, I had reasoned that a church job would just be too demanding for a full-time graduate student. I had reasoned that, right, using my limited skills with no input from anyone else. And when I finished seminary, I realized that I had missed four years of opportunity to apply what I was learning in real life. I could have been working at a church where the classes I'm studying right now, I can use this stuff to begin to see how does it help. And I missed that chance. Then also when I graduated, I realized too I had missed the opportunity to build bridges and establish some, some work potential opportunities by being involved in, in leading within a church where people could say, well, yes, let me recommend Eric for a job or let me introduce you, Eric, as we go, right? I had just missed a lot of opportunities. Looking back, I realized I was a fool not to go ask some other men who'd been in my shoes what I should do. Why didn't I go talk to some men who were second career pastors who had gone to seminary and say, hey, what do you think? I'm a little apprehensive about committing to work in a church, but I'll bet you I would have gotten some really good counsel. But I didn't think I needed. It never occurred to me to do that. And unfortunately, it made life harder for me when I got out. It took me longer to find a job and then longer to learn how to use the tools I've been given in seminary. So I'm just confessing to you today, as much as God has put wise people in my life, sometimes I'm kind of foolish and I don't utilize the gifts he's given. So I learned that lesson that we all need wisdom. There was another lesson here in Rehoboam's going to those old men uh, for wisdom. Lesson two is you need wisdom. Lesson two is go to people who are more experienced than you to get it, right? Uh, Rehoboam took counsel with the old man. And I hope you don't think that's that's not supposed to sound negative. That's a badge of honor. The, The writer of the scripture is telling us these were men who were experienced. They had wisdom. They'd been around Think about that. These were the men who'd served under his father Solomon for years, right? They were experienced, seasoned. And Rehoboam was wise to go to them, and that's where he started. Why do you think he started with the old men? I think he started there because he knew with age came wisdom, right? He knew that. So he started where he needed to go. He went to these men who'd been around the block, and they gave him good advice, They said, basically, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. They said, Rehoboam, if you will take on the heart of a servant towards the people in the kingdom, if you will go to them in order to serve them, and if you will speak kindly and be kind to them as a servant, then they will be your servants forever. It will be a win-win for you, Rehoboam. You serve them and let them know you, you come as a servant. They will serve you back. That was great counsel. It was not only great, it was godly counsel. Because I want you to think about the words that Jesus said. Remember these words in Matthew 20. When Jesus said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord their authority over their subjects. He said, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, so you also must be a servant. See, their counsel was godly. It was almost prophetic, wasn't it? It was almost like they were prophesying of what Jesus was going to say when he talked about what it meant to be great. So these old men... They gave him good counsel. They gave him godly counsel. And if only Rehoboam would have listened. But he proved to be the kind of person that is one of my pet peeves. And I'm sure I am a pet peeve to many people. We all have those. One of mine, and maybe you share this frustration too. One of my pet peeves is people that that ask for your time in order to ask for your advice. And you give it to them. And they ignore it. Does that bother anyone else? I want to see that I'm not the only person that this is frustrating. People get in a bind and they come to you and they want your advice and they need your help. And you tell them and then they go and they totally ignore it. 
And I just want to say, look, if you didn't want it, I, I don't mind. It wasn't that I, that I needed to feel like you needed me, but don't waste my time, right? So Rehoboam went, he asked, he got great counsel, and then he abandoned it. And he, he chose now, and this is the beginning of his foolish decision, decisions, to then consult with the young men that had grown up with him. So Rehoboam decides instead of listening to the elders with wisdom, he would go talk to his buddies. Good move, Rehoboam. So uh, instead of urging him to come to them with a servant's heart so that the people would serve him willingly, they said, here's what you need to do, Rehoboam. Double down on the authoritarianism. You let them know who's in charge. Don't you dare let them think that you're weak. So they said, tell them your father made the yoke heavy. Well, I'm going to make it heavier. I'm bigger and badder than Solomon was, so you better listen to me and do what I say. That was their advice. The old wise men, they gave him godly advice. These young foolish buddies gave him godless advice. They appealed strictly to the flesh, to the pride of man. So there's another lesson. We all need wisdom. We need wisdom from people with more experience than we have. And we need to use it when we get it, right? If you don't act on good wisdom, then wanting it and asking for it, that stuff doesn't matter at all. You can pray all you want for wisdom, but if you're not going to do it, it doesn't matter. I suspect I know why Rehoboam went to his buddies for their advice. I'm I'm speculating a little bit, doesn't really tell us, but um, I suspect he sort of figured they would tell him what he wanted to hear. There must have been something he didn't like about the advice from the older men, or otherwise he would have gone with their advice. He was, they were the first ones he went to. He didn't like something about it. So he went to his buddies, and they proved to be those kinds of friends that would appeal to his ego. They were yes men. And so they stoked the fires of his vanity and his pride and his desire to have power. And they told him, you're the man. You better let everybody know it, Rehoboam. And listen, I want to tell you something. This temptation is probably more real now for us than it was for Rehoboam. And and the reason I say this is because he didn't have Facebook. Okay? If you have social media, you have a place to go and and post matters that, that require wisdom. And you have a bunch of yes men and women who are going to give you hearts and likes and that kind of stuff and tell you what you want to hear. That's really what social media is. It becomes for us uh, not a wisdom chamber, but an echo chamber. And listen, as a pastor, this has, this has hurt my heart many times. When I see people who are members of my churches post stuff on there that's totally foolish, and I look at a bunch of church people's names, thumb up and give them the thumbs up on it. I'm like, uh-uh. Don't give the like to this person's foolishness, right? It's obviously foolish, and, I, and I'm foolish too. Like, I'm, I'm here, I'm being humble enough to say, sometimes I'm the fool. But if I am, please don't give me a like if I post about it on social media. See, we face the Herculean task of not living to get the affirmations of people who's, who are pretty much there anyway to give us a yes, a thumbs up, and a like, Right? Um, culturally, generationally, we've got generations that that is the most important thing. Yes, give me your like, give me your affirmation. So 99% of our friends are yes men or yes women. They'll tell us what we want to hear. So we've got to be careful because what we need is wisdom from people who will tell us God's truth, not what we want to hear. Those two things are not always the same. It's not enough just to go to experienced people. You also need to go to godly people. People that you trust know God's will and his word, and they will impart that to you. They love you enough to tell you that, even if it's not what you're thinking when you go to them, right? Um, And let's be honest, that's hard. It's hard to go ask for counsel from someone that you might suspect they're probably going to tell me what I don't want to hear. Well, 
That's, that's why they're in your mind and you need to go talk to them. Rehoboam went to those old men first, but he didn't like it. So then he went to find somebody that would tell him what he wanted to hear. Now, has anybody noticed a glaring omission in Rehoboam's decision-making process? There's one thing I notice he hasn't done at this point. Anybody know what it is? Pray. He didn't ask God, right? Look, what is the, the ultimate source of wisdom that you want? Human wisdom, even from smart, wise people. Let me tell you this. There are brilliant people out there that are fools. Some of the most intelligent people in the world are fools. The Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. You can find the smartest, most accomplished, intellectual, academic people that are fools because in their pride they reject God, right? Rehoboam, the one thing I noticed there, he asked the old men, he asked the young men, but he never asked God. And I want to be careful because the message today isn't ignore human input and wisdom at all. But seek wisdom from others in conjunction with your search for wisdom from God. See, what you will find is that as you're asking God for wisdom, he will give you some of the greatest gifts in your life in the form of other people that will help you and give you wisdom. But don't just rely on them. Listen, I'm a pastor, and if you come to me and you've got some question and you want counsel, ask me and then pray, right? I know I said it was my pet peeve when people don't do what I say. That's not because I think I'm always right. It's really more that most times when people come, the answer isn't hard. It's just they don't want to hear it, right? Most people don't come to me with problems that are so complex only Eric could ever know the answer. No, it's usually, hey, look, the answer is pretty clear here. Are you willing to do it? Right? That's why I get frustrated when they aren't. You came to me, I'm the preacher, we, we looked in the Bible, the answer's clear, and you didn't do it. Right? But don't just rely on me. Don't come to me and ask for wisdom and ignore God. He knows better than me. You might see if, if maybe he uses me to affirm what he's already telling you. Right? There's a glaring omission in this process that Rehoboam basically didn't seek wisdom from the Lord. And he didn't, therefore, rely on God's gift of wise counsel from people who had it. They gave it to him, and he ignored it. And he paid the price. What happened? Well, the people rejected him. Did you catch there? They stoned his appointed taskmaster. He said, I'm going to make the yoke heavier. And he sent out the taskmaster to do it, and they stoned him. They killed him. And Rehoboam got in his chariot and he headed for the hills because he knew they'll kill me next. And so 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel rejected Rehoboam. They said, we're going to make Jeroboam our king, the man that wasn't from Solomon's family, wasn't the rightful heir. And they followed him. They led Rehoboam to rule over two kingdoms, Judah and Benjamin, The other 10 all went their own way. And that fracture, as I mentioned, was devastating to Israel. It lasted practically forever through their history. And it ultimately led to the downfall of both the two tribes that followed Rehoboam and the 10 that followed Jeroboam. There's good news for us today. We have God's word. We have stories like this about Rehoboam where we can learn what not to do. There's a lot of power in the stories like Abigail and Solomon's prayer for wisdom where we can learn what to do. Sometimes some of life's best lessons are let me tell you what not to do. And God has given us those. The question I want to leave you with today is this. What is God's lesson for you about wisdom? Are you aware right now that you need it? Have you gotten used to going through life without seeking help or wisdom from others to the point where it's just your default mode and you don't get wisdom from anybody? Ask God to change it. Um, Ask God to give you the humility to see what's already true, which is this, we all need wisdom from other people. Are you seeking wisdom from the right people? That might be the next question. Who are you listening to? If you never turn off CNN or Fox News or whatever, God have mercy on us. 
We need to listen to the right voices for wisdom. People with experience, but also people who honor and respect God. People who are willing to speak God's truth, not just their truth, into our lives. Are you spending time evaluating God's word to gain wisdom from it and to gain a standard with which you can measure the counsel that others give you, right? I will find myself sometimes I'm going to put something on Facebook or something like that, and I'm not tend to be real contentious about that, but there are times, how many of you, if you've put something there and then you look at it and you think, ah, I probably shouldn't put that, delete, delete, right? Uh, there are times when I'm about to post something and I think, Hmm, you know, the Bible says this. Jesus said, hmm, I probably shouldn't post that. Delete. If we don't spend time reading the scriptures and we don't value the scripture as the, the gold standard of truth and wisdom, we're going to be fools. So let's learn from Rehoboam. We all need wisdom. Let's seek it from people that have it, that are experienced, not just people that tell us what we want to hear. Let's have the courage and follow through to actually do it, even when it's not necessarily what we want to do and it's not the easy job. And let's always evaluate every counsel we get by God's word and his character, his will. If we do, uh, Joshua 1.8 uh, promised uh, that, that if Joshua didn't let the book of the law depart from his mouth, but he meditated on it day and night, being careful to do with wisdom all that was written in it, he would be prosperous and successful as God defines prosperity and success. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the story, the life of Rehoboam. Lord, that we can learn from his mistakes. Lord, today I look around this room and I am grateful for the collective wisdom that you have placed into my life. Lord, I'm thankful for the godly character of so many of these men and women. But Lord, I recognize the potential in these stories we read, whether it's Solomon or his son Rehoboam, that God, one minute we can act with wisdom, one minute we can seek wise counsel, one minute we can be committed to doing it your way, and the next, if we are not diligent and careful, we can plunge into foolishness in the blink of an eye. Lord, teach us the way of wisdom. God, teach us to be humble, realizing day by day that we constantly need wisdom, that that search never ends. God, give us the humility to see and value the wisdom you've placed in the lives of those around us, the experience that we don't have. Lord, teach us to, to know you, to know your words, your character, your commands, your will, so that, God, we can be prosperous and successful as you define those things. And Lord, I thank you today that that is your will for us, that your will is good, that God, you promise us the gift of wisdom, that you desire to give wisdom generously to those that would ask, to those that would ask the right people, to those that would ask, Lord, with the intention of doing Lord, show us the way of wisdom, we ask. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.